So, good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the first.
video was Tina, my sister Tina Morton, also a contributor to No, Burning at Midnight All. We, she sent the file at 6 a.m. this morning, so we will watch it now. <laughs>
uh, seek us out. We're here in Philadelphia with the Only Rape Crisis Center, and I am very excited and honored about being part of this event. So thank you so much. speaker before the, <clears throat> we screen the film, and last but never least, is Poet Laureate, Mother, Professor, International Human Rights Activist, Sister Sonia Sanchez. <laughs> I started working in, on NOAA in 1994. Come up, Sister Sonia. Yeah. Yeah. was the first person who gave a major donation to a 26-year-old who was making a film called, No, The Rape Documentary. And everybody was saying no to no, Sister Sonia was saying yes. And so I'm just really honored because she <clears throat> really did. I asked her and she said, I will make time. And she was like, you are my child. And we have to make time for our children. Yes. <laughs> hello, how are you? Hi. Really, I most of the time say, how do you do? It is hot in here, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> in this country and in the world, and most especially when we have a government that will put people you know, in the White House and put people on, um, what is that? The Supreme Court. Court. Those nine, whatever, right? <laughs> <laughs> and have you believe that you are crazy? You are a crazy one. And you cannot see and you do not hear, but the point is we see and we hear. And most certainly thank you, my sister, for this glorious film, most important film. It should be shown in every uh, junior high, you know, sixth grade, high school, every, every, college, every place there are women, it should be shown. And then it should be shown to men, you know, most definitely, because they need to hear this and know this, as someone said, well, it was just a little penetration, someone said once. And I said, isn't that something? That's like a little pregnancy. <laughs> but this sister, Aisha, this child of our womb, our resistance. Because when you think of uh, Aisha, you've got to think of resistance, that word resists, you know, because that is intrinsic in her body, in her womb. In our wounds, it should be. This young woman saying, I want to be heard. You need to hear this part of our struggle. And we finally listened because of people like Sister Tony K. Bambara and Brother Essex. You know, when I saw the two of them, I just thought about, you know, the days that I just sister studied with Sister Tony K. Bambara. And one of the things that we know, do we not? that we find in her hearts, in our arms, in our minds, you know, all of the things that guide her along this long trail of a country's denial. And we see her now walking, talking, continuing the tradition of activism, the tradition of work, love, saying what needs to be said. And we thank you, my dear sister, you pioneer of discussing things kept quiet in the country, in the houses, in the doorways, in the bedrooms, hidden in folds of flesh at our, our homes and schools and churches even. The folds of rape covering our young girls and boys. 
this is our thanks and appreciation to you. And one of the things that I wanted to, to say simply is that I'm reminded with her activism, what dear sister Alice Walker said, that activism is the rent I pay for being on this planet. Yes. And it certainly is that. And I want to quote also for some people, Basho, the great poet who said, don't follow the footsteps of those who came before. Seek what they sought. Mm. And so you people who want to follow our dear sister, you're not going to follow her footsteps. You understand that? but you're going to seek what she sought and so therefore it continues, you see. That's what this is truly all about, always seeking what she sought. And what she sought was to inform us and to tell us and to make us aware of what it really means, you know, in this country, in this world, you know, to be raped, you know, to be, in a sense, hidden in a family who does not want to talk about even the idea of molestation. I, those of you who read me know that I did a haku, a long haku sequence to my sister who was molested. And I think about this on many levels and I wrote it but I never published it during the time she was alive because she never really wanted to talk about it. She went to a psychiatrist and a therapist but she never wanted to discuss it. And once when I tried to discuss it with her, you know, she screamed at me and wouldn't speak for me for months. I wish she had known our dear sister. I wish she had traveled with me sometimes and understood simply at some particular point that you have to talk about it. You have to finally say to the world, I was raped, I was molested, but that does not mean that I am not still human. You know, and she always thought that there was something wrong with her. Do you understand that? But one of the things, the only thing in close that was wrong with her is that she was beautiful. And you and I know that beautiful children need protection. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful children, male or female, need to be protected because people are always touching beautiful children, if you understand that. So I want to say simply, what an honor to be here, to celebrate 25 years, my dear sister, Aisha, 25 years. 25 years ago, I was in my 60s, people. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, <laughs> Thank you for making me laugh. <laughs> I am not 85. Yeah. And what an honor it is. <laughs> to be on this earth, and to be surrounded by women and men who understand what it truly means to be an activist, what it truly means to discover, finally, what it means to walk upright as human beings. And one of the ways we do this is acknowledge that we do hurt children at some point. So let us remember one word that is so important. And all the people who are thinking and rethinking this, you got to say it, resist. Can you say resist?
to see this incredible and celebrate the 25th anniversary of the yes. But what you should know, in case you don't know, and before I say what you should know, in case you don't know, let me just, <laughs> let me just back up a little bit and say that um, Aisha and I also met back in those times that Sonia was talking about. And I actually knew Aisha before I met her because of Louis Messiah and Tony K. Bambara telling me, you absolutely have to go and see the work of Image Weavers, and you need to do it right now. <laughs> so we saw Tina Morton and Aisha and how it has continued. But what you need to know is that Aisha Shahida Sims is a black, feminist, lesbian, writer, scholar, lecturer, and the incredible documentary filmmaker of No, and the editor of the right now brand new release that we're also celebrating, Love with Accountability. I just want to thank you. But um, <laughs> um, Tony Morrison, when we were here um, for Tony K. for Tony K. Mamara's memorial, talked about this institution that she and Tony created called um, the Walk Black on Women Walk on Water. Black Women Do Don't Walk on Don't Walk on Water Awards, right? <laughs> because Black women do the work, right? Yeah. And Toni Morrison also wrote about the fact that, this is back in 1980, and she said that, you know, it's a writing, people were saying it's a writing, it doesn't have to be political, da 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 da. Toni Morrison responded, everything I do, whether it's writing or anything else, has to be about the community, yes. it has to be about the village, it has to be about us. Aisha's work is about the community, yes. it's about the village, and it is about us. And she also said, whatever I do has to be unapologetically political and irrevocably beautiful at the same time. Aisha's work and Aisha is, in fact, unapologetically yes. political yes. and I'm going to substitute um, irrevocable now, the Tony K word, irresistibly beautiful. Yeah. So now we will um, watch No, which is being presented in English subtitles um, for um, our deaf and hard of hearing siblings. And I just want to say that it is very, very, there are many, many people, and I'll do that after because I want us to get to know who made this evening possible. Um, it's very, very powerful for me to be here because I, I screened my first short in 1993, Silence Broken, which was produced in a Tony K. Bombara workshop at Scribe Video Center, founded by Louis Messiah, who is in the audience. And so, years later to be able to screen No Here, screened it in Philadelphia. The Leeway Foundation sponsored a, a screening at the Painted Bride, which is no longer, unfortunately, here when it first came out. But just to return here is just so profound and powerful. My sister, Heidi Renee Lewis, who is at uh, Colorado College, she made it possible in terms of she inscribed um, renting the space. All of this is possible because of the Annenberg School for Communication, John Jackson, the dean is here, just beginning collaborative, um, and then many, many, many others who I'll talk about afterwards, but I just need to just lift up, because this didn't happen by accident. It took six months, it was a village led by one, um, and I'm really, really happy to be here and look forward to us watching and discussing No with so many of the people in No for the first time and the people who made No together in the room. It's just, it, this is historical. And we are recording it and Facebook living the program so people will be able to see it because I was like, we can't miss this. This is critical. Um, so please, this is a film about rape. It is also about healing, but it's about rape. 
take care of yourselves while, you know, it is not a sign of weakness to step outside during the film. Um, war is here, and so like I would organize it, war is here um, in terms of uh, support services. And then afterwards, I'm, everyone who had made no possible, we're gonna bring them up and talk. So that's why I wanna get to the film. So thank you. So, so fortunate that many people who are on the screen and behind the screen are in the audience. And so, oh, <laughs> and so what's going to happen? So, there are chairs, but then those of us who are younger or more agile are going to have this say, We don't have enough chairs for everybody, so the chairs are for the elders or people who want a chair. And if you can sit on stage, please feel free. So, I just created a list of um, uh, alphabetical order because I didn't want to forget it. I, I hope most of these folks are here. So my cousin, who's an actor, uh, Sultan Ali, if you could please come on up. Uh, he was in the uh, narrative portion um, during uh, talking about the period uh, when uh, Dr. Bradley Guy Shepta was talking about uh, sexual violence during a period of reconstruction. Dr. Charlotte Pierce Baker, the author of Surviving the Silence, is here. John Brayden Tech. And, uh, and no, please come. <laughs> Joan Brandon, who filmed everything except for the closing dance sequence in the film. She's the director of photography, black woman filmmaker. Faith Pennant, 
Smith, who is an actor and dancer in the film, she, um, um, in the section with Janelle White was talking about being uh, raised, and you saw the images of her and uh, Tamara Xavier, who I'll call up later, but Faith Thinnett is here. I don't know if Evelyn Laurent is in the audience. I saw her, uh, Dr. Evelyn Laurent. She is uh, the Spanish translator. She has taken note throughout South America, specifically in Afro-descended um, communities. She translated known into Spanish. She was here to run out to be back. Very, I mean, Dr. Rachel Aki Quinn, who is the co-author with Solomon Chatillon, Dr. Solomon Chatillon, who's not here this evening, of the study guide. So please come on up, Rachel. And Loretta J. Ross, the third director of the oldest Great Crisis Center. DC Great Crisis Center. and Research Center, and while, even though Dr. Cole had re recently left, it was still, you know, the Cole Guy Sheftall University. <laughs> the first feminist that I ever met on April 22, 1969, Dr. Gwendolyn Zahara Simmons, my mother.
it up, and I'm to, I'm, I have so many questions to ask folks, but I want to open it up to ask the people who may know a reality, and particularly in terms of when we think about the survivors who told their stories, and they're constantly telling them over and over and over again, because people are encountering no for the first time and hearing the scholarship and the activism. And you know, when I first started making no, I was told to take the white women out because they, <clears throat> you know, because it wasn't, um, uh, that white women were not involved in the oppression of black women. Uh, I was told not to include um, um, uh, queer women in talking about sexual violence. There was so much. I was, where did you find all these smart black women from? It was a, a comment from a funder, HBO, that they're, they're so beautiful and articulate, it's just not realistic. So that this is part of the journey. This is why it took so long in a term that Salamisha uh, used to say it was economic censorship, because there are many ways that we can shut a thing down. And as we all know in this room, when you don't give money, it's a way to shut things down. But the power and beauty of not getting the money as I wanted was that, in the words of Tony K. Bambara, I was accountable to the community. So people ranging from a dollar to a, a franc, because that's when I was starting before the euro, you know, were giving donations, were screenings across this country, fun, educational fundraising screenings, and in, in Europe, as I talked about, uh, Carol and in, in Italy, that that's what made this film a reality. And, and as a result, I became accountable to the community and not to the funders. And at the time that I got the incredible, huge grant from the Ford Foundation, I the, fun, the film was done on my terms and they funded making it accessible globally. But I do want to acknowledge Pat Clark and Inel Cox Bagwell, who after Sonia Sanchez gave sizable contribution. Robert Brand, who's in the office, uh, in this audience, um, who allowed, uh, gave, donat donated office space for 10 years. So we're talking about photocopying and meetings and all of that. That it just, the Estrella Foundation was the first foundation to give money yeah. to know. Yeah. So it just really radical, red and roses part. The, the Lead Way Transformation Award enabled me to get it over the final finish line. Valentine Foundation. I mean, and these, and I'm naming these foundations because they're not the big boys and girls as we hear, but it, 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 it was it's women's foundations, lesbian foundations, radical anti-racist white folks who were like, we're going to make this film happen, and definitely the community. So I'm going to leave it at that, and let's open it up to questions to everybody up here. So don't be shy. Yes. <laughs> because amongst this panel, probably, you know, I'm one of the ones who's been working on the issue for some of the longest time. As a matter of fact, uh, Indira heard, uh, reminded me, that, uh, hey, Indira, that we're coming up on the 50th anniversary of the DC Rape Crisis Center. <laughs> question of have we made changes? Yes, we have, because we built a global movement to end violence against women that simply didn't exist before 1972. Right. So we've established a gold standard that said 
this violence is unacceptable and people should not have to put up with that and we have broadened it to go beyond women to include gender non-conforming people. We were the first to talk about violence against men as part of the gay initiation culture. So we named the violence, we established programs and protocols to deal with the violence, but at the same time, we have not changed totally the rape culture that a colonialist, settler colonialist, white supremacist culture called America makes money off of. Okay, maybe it's an over ask to think that a anti-violence movement could successfully end all the violence is that makes America rich. And so we've got a long way to go and I'll just close by saying that I think we have made another un unexpected leap with the Me Too movement yes, yes. that Toronto Burke started, another black woman yes. who should be in this conversation. And of course, you know, it got co-opted and spread and done and all kinds of things because that's what happens. You know, they Elvis us. Everything we create, they steal. Yeah. Um, <laughs> which is what they do. But for me right now, we're looking at the intersection of these violences with all the other issues that we're talking about, like reproductive justice, environmental justice, racial justice, all of these other things. And that's the next uh, territory. That's the next brave new world we have to conquer. Because we can't allow these other movements that get our support to remain silent over the violations that take place, even as we do human rights work. Just because we do human rights work doesn't justify you violating the human rights of the people doing the work. And so you've got a long way to go. But I also don't want us to understate how much we've done because that's a way to make us think that we shouldn't struggle because we can look how far we have to go versus how far we've come. that we do it in our way, 
you know, she started with invoking the ancestors. So, so how we open up the space and the awareness that this is not just about us, but on whose shoulders we stand and that we take that with us. And so our accountability is not only for us and for now, but for those who came before, for those who come after. So that's a different approach about who we are. And a big part of it is just courage. You know, that we have to be courageous. And because silence is powerful. You know, so it's easy, you know, because you have the people who perpetrate, but you have all those others who are silent. You know, so there's so much guilt and so much shame. So to hold each other by hand and say, you know, we are all failing in this. We are all failing in holding each other up and being the best that we can be. And so that we need to be courageous and have empathy and compassion so that we can heal each other and, and, and draw the strength from those that came before us. And, and you know, I, just, I want to share with you when we, when Joan and I, when Joan and I did uh, the dance, we found a place and there was a grave site and we poured libation and we said a prayer and we asked for the ancestors to come for us to tell this story. And, and Aisha had given us music, specific music that was, I don't know how long it would take, like 20 minutes or something, he said it was two minutes. And I said, Joan, you have one take, because something is gonna come through, I can only do it one time, the camera rolling, whatever's going to come through, I cannot do it again. And so the dance lasted like 20 minutes. It lasted 20 minutes, and I remember the music starting, and I remember waking up at the end. You know, when the sun hit me, and then we stopped, and then these deer came by and stopped and looked at us, and we knew it was good, and then the deer left, and then we said, and then we're done. You know, so, so, so it is an honor to be able to be part of this with all these people is an honor what Aisha created and what she fought for and the fact that we open ourselves up and say this is not just about us, but it's about bigger, it's about bigger than us, about what needs to be done and then we have these resources, these spiritual resources and our ancestors that we draw on and that's the only way we're going to make this better, that we have to do it our way. video that said that we can hold, if I remember correctly, we can hold, um, I guess maybe men accountable or our communities accountable if we do certain things like outside of the, the injustice system. So my take sometimes is a little bit really, really to the left. Uh, I know a lot of you have seen that movie Black Panther. And so I always, after the rape, I have been trying to reinvent myself as one of the women, the warriors with the spear. Yeah. And there's a part in the movie, well, when, the, when the, uh, the documentary was playing, it popped into my head like, the sister, um, when she had the battle and her boyfriend had turned on the other side, right. and then he all of a sudden bowed down and he says to her, you wouldn't have killed me, would you? And she gets the spear and says, for Wakanda? That's kind of like where I am right now. I mean, that's just where I am. So I'm like, some folks, I believe, may be able to be rehabilitated, but if there's some, I'm like, uh, I think you just need to go. And have some kind of way to make that go. I mean, I'm just being blunt. Um, and that's about what I have to say. I know that comes across as violence, but I'm thinking about, when I think about that, I am thinking about the little girls um, that's got to come after me, and, and, and the little boys, and the elders. And um, I just feel like, if I gotta take somebody out to save this future, yes. then so be it. Because we can't continue to be a drain, and, and you know, it's, it's, I just don't know. But that is one of the things, one of my solutions that I would like to uh, uh, see implemented, <laughs> where we kind of like control ourselves within our communities, and we need more men that are in these positions of power to come out and call brothers out. I mean, get in front of the congregation. I mean, what are you doing? I'm gonna build a community.
opportunity. When you won't even call brothers out for victimizing black women. We are the mothers of civilization. You should be protecting us at all costs because my duty is to protect you at all costs. Asantua and Kromatura, and I live in organized here in Philadelphia. First of all, I want to give a shout out to Aisha. Aisha, thank you so much for this film, and all of those who work with you on the film. And thank you for bringing us all together, because I'm seeing my longtime comrade that I haven't seen in 15 years, Denise Jones. You are beautiful, beautiful. Loretta, I just want to say, no matter what you thought back in the day in the Pan-Africanist movement, a lot of sisters were paying attention to you and others who were doing this work. And we always appreciated you, and we always fought some of the knucklehead Pan-Africanist brothers because we know you were bringing the truth, right? Um, so Loretta, Denise Jones, other people on the stage I, I think I know I've met. Thank you all. Reverend uh, Tracy West, I heard you preach one time. You definitely got your preach on. But uh, anyway, my question is, when it comes to accountability, what does that now look like when we have situations uh, such as in our movement spaces? We look at what happened to international social organization earlier this year where they imploded uh, around the sexual assault uh, situation of one of their members, one of their leadership. Uh, here in Philadelphia, we have a police officer, high ranking, for many years, sexually assaulted his own women colleagues, and he's just now being arrested. We look at sexual assaults against women and transgender people at the border with Border Patrol. How do we hold all these different forces accountable? Thank you. I, Aisha, I thank you for, I'm glad that I know you. I'm glad that you are special to me. Did you stand up for you? Yeah. I am yeah. standing. <laughs> I am so proud to know you from the days on at, at, over at the, you know where I'm talking about, where you were working. AFC. AFC. I'm glad to know your dad. Your mom, I thank you. And for me to live, to see it where it is now, you are a bad, bad woman. Yes, you are. Yes, you are. I, I, I grabbed the mic again largely because I like to talk, but, you know, so I have to own that. But we've had this conversation about accountability for almost 50 years. So, so let's just talk about where we are, because we knew that the criminal injustice system <laughs> commits more violence against our community than solving or ending any violence in our community. We knew that 50 years ago. So calling for police or reporting to the police just invites them to re-victimize the entire community without ever protecting black women. They don't. But accountability without love and grace ain't nothing but white supremacists revered. That I do know. We don't have disposable people. You know, if we were brave enough to go into court and reformatory and talk to men who had been convicted of raping and murdering women in the 1970s. Why the hell we can't talk to someone who tells an off-temper joke today? What's going on here? What's going on here where we've taken accountability and defined it as revenge and punishment and think we're doing something original? Ain't nothing original about that. Ain't nothing radical or revolutionary about that. So I want to raise the question of can we create accountability, like Aisha said, love with accountability. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not punishment, not revenge, not cancel culture, not all the things that you think are just performance activism because you really ain't protecting nobody except from your own trauma and fear. Wow. I'm just saying. <laughs> So, first of 
first I wanted to just thank um, you, Asanto, for the question and Portia for the question because I, I, I think that this was the purpose, well, the purpose really was the 25th anniversary ago. And then it was like, oh, a book is coming out and it's conference, but really to these next, tomorrow, all day, we're really going to be tackling with these issues. Uh, tomorrow at the Annenberg School for Communication, uh, one day conference um, with three plenary panels, talking, blazing the trails, Loretta Ross and Beverly Guy Sheftal and other Charlotte Pierce Baker, um, beyond the panel, and in global, I mean, in sexual violence in uh, diasporic black communities with Evelyn, Laurent Perot, Esther, Ma from Ghana, Etsy Betts. Um, we're going to be talking about these issues. And then sexual violence in marginalized communities, really looking at the margins within the margins with Amitha Swadim, Shahrazad Tillet, um, Ahmad Green Hayes, and others. And then tomorrow evening at the African American Museum in Philadelphia, we will have the official book launch of Love with Accountability, which is 43 uh, essays by diasporic black people talking about child sexual abuse. Um, and really talking about how we can disrupt and end it without involving the criminal justice system. What does a, what does love with accountability look like? And so over 20, over like about 27 of the 43 contributors, if they're not in this room, they are here. And they will be at the Air Museum. So this will be a powerful, you know, this is like the launch kickoff to really talk about and tease out these issues that we have that have been going on. Like so this is not the first time as Loretta said in the 70s, and I'm sure before we know with uh, Rosa Parks, we know what's going on in SNCC in terms of what my mother talked about in, in her uh, in, 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 in uh, the Laurel Project in, in Laurel, Mississippi. So these are ongoing um, conversations, and I'm very excited that we are centering black feminist perspectives and experiences um, to do this. And we're doing it for free, wheelchair accessible, ASL interpreters. I just want to congratulate my cousin for all of the hard work and all of the commitment and persistence blood, sweat, and tears that she had to go through to do this. And my, my question also is around accountability and what do you see as the accountability that we as women have to uh, demonstrate? I remember being in a church, actually in Cleveland, where the, the, the Mike Tyson thing was going on, where a, min a visiting minister talked about, well, you know these women that are walking around with these short skirts, what do they expect? Now, I took it upon myself to go talk to him afterwards right in front of my minister. He said, oh, your, your member is uh, upset with me. I said, because do you realize there could have been women, I'm sure there were women in that congregation who have experienced rape, and, for you, and his excuse was, well, you know, we don't have a prepared sermon. Well, I mean, he was like, very up in age. I could give a sermon, so um, at some point, what, what should we be doing as women uh, when we come across these things? My sister, I wish I had a simple and definitive response, but there's one strong suggestion I want to make. Imagine how different the world would be if every black woman raised feminist sons. And so, for me, the conversation can always go to the systemic stuff that encourages, that, that promotes, that rewards violence against women. But your question asks, what will we do? What would happen if, in addition to being constantly in the struggle against racism, gender inequality, homophobia, transphobia, if we, regardless of our own multiple identities, said, I, as a woman, will raise feminist sons 
and feminist daughters too. Hi, uh, my name is Ceci Alfonso, and I'm this is the first time being here and seeing your film, and I just want to say that I am affirmed, and, and thank you for that. But I have a question in terms of accountability. Um, rather recently in our history, we uh, had a icon, and I'm talking about Bill Cosby, uh, who was, um, quote, uh, made accountable for his violations of, of, of women. Now, do you think that uh, he would have been even taken to trial if he had violated women of color? Because I don't know, maybe he did. I didn't he see. Did. He did. He did. He did. He did. He did. However, but the, the fact, the fact that I didn't see black women in the media being um, expressing their outrage and the assault that happened to them uh, says to a lot of young black women that whoever it is, if a black man rapes a white woman, uh, the system could behave consistently with um, what it's done in the past. But anyway, I would love to hear you comment on that because if you talk about accountability, I saw a film that basically talked about how we, including myself, who was a survivor, um, did not say anything because we were scared. And uh, I am a product of the 70s and the 60s, and I know what it means to just take it because it means that the brothers are going to be uh, protected. Thank you. I'll take it. Thank you. Black women are known for 
well, I gotta go get the pot on the top. Okay. I gotta go do this. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta. And then by the time you get to the kind of thinking you really wanna do, you're tired. So maybe what's, what's involved is not staying in the zones that we have been sort of offered up to consider as, as uh, what you gotta do. We, we might not have to do as much as we think we have to do. Maybe what we have to do is do us. <laughs> do us. And then go somewhere. And think about it. There's a hell of a lot, excuse my expression, I don't have to tell anybody in here that there's a hell of a lot of stuff to learn in this world. And we don't have to stay in one place. And we all know that. We have all been lots of places. But we don't have to stay in somebody else's concept of what duty is, what duty is, who I can talk to, who I can't talk to because of my skin color. I'll stand Thank you. I'll stand Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I see Jocelyn, and then we have to, and then you know, Cece, and then that's, yeah. Okay. Thank you, Aisha. Thank you for this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful event. Um, real quick, uh, you began the event with such a graceful trigger warning, and you supported that, those words with actual counseling outside. I just wanted to ask you your trajectory over the last, you know, 25 years facilitating gatherings and screenings like this. How have you changed or evolved or worked with trigger warnings? And maybe other educators and curators can talk about that too. Um, I, when I started working on no, I didn't well, I didn't even know what a trigger warning was. And I, I had no idea. I thought at that point that I started working on you No know, Get on the Bus, Spike Lee's film, where uh, 10 black men or a hundred, gave $100,000. Like, I was in some naive, they're like, we're going to just, you know, Tamara and I were like, yeah, we're just going to get this film done in a year. So, you know, we were 23 and 20 hours. It's just kind of crazy. Um, but I mean, I'm glad I didn't know, because if I knew, I probably wouldn't have even gone in. And, had a, and I was so in deep when I was like, I had to just keep going. But it was therapy for me. I was very fortunate to have a black feminist therapist who I still have, who when I had single digits in my checking account, which was a regular occurrence, um, she didn't let that determine if she would allow me to have access to her services. So that she really, I mean, that was her way in which she supported the making of this film. Many of this, these people here, particularly the crew, the sets were like, were black feminist sets where we would, uh, I would ask, I would definitely do interviews, but then everybody else would open up and a ask questions. We'd ha always have good food, particularly when we were at Gail's house. Um, you know, so that was just really Gail and Angela's home, I should say. That was really, really critical um, for us. Um, and then, I mean, I know like processing with Sharon through the editing and all of that. So I just think being in community, and this is just Aisha's experience of really knowing, and it also was reaffirming to my own experiences as a survivor relying on books like Wounds of the Spirit by Tracy West, or Surviving the Silence by Charlotte Pierce Baker. Yeah. I mean, you know, like Gender Talk, Jeanette Cole and Beverly Guy Shepto, to just really kind of pull, upon, pull on those resources um, for myself. And then since 2002, Buddhist meditation, all the way, everybody knows I go away on Mars. Yeah. <laughs> Silent 30 days of just kind of rejuvenating Fortunately, it didn't cost money, so and I had time because I didn't have a traditional job. So that's how I um, did that for myself. I will pass the mic, but I, I do want to say something because my I have evolved, and one of the things I really struggle, and I talk about this with many friends in here, like people who all of a sudden were pro-gay, and I was like, well, they were pro-gay in the '90s, and that's fine. <laughs> but my whole thing is like share the trajectory. Don't act yeah. like you've always been there. Right. Right. And so it is in that context that I want to talk about my understanding of womanhood and that it is not just cis, it is trans. And so that it is very, like, if I could do this film again, I would include the stories of my trans sisters in this film. 
because so many of my sisters have been raped. Many, as we know, are being murdered. And so I can't do the film again, but thankfully their voices are in the anthology. But just in terms of my understanding of womanhood and what does it mean to be sexually assaulted and what, what does womanhood mean? Like that it's, you know, cisgender women don't have a patent on it. Um, and just to really honor that. And then gender non-conforming, binary, and it, and it gets so complicated, right? Because black cis women have never been women in terms of society. So how do we do that and not feel like we're fighting the little bit of crumbs that are thrown at us with our black trans sisters? So I just really want to own that, like my understanding, and I credit, you know, Amitha Swadeen, who's in the audience. I, I credit Etsy Betts, Janice Poindexter, you know, trans sisters of color, like that these organizations have helped me to understand. So any form of understanding is about the work of the community. So I didn't just wake up with trans awareness. Um. Hi, everybody. Um, Aisha, I just want to thank you for this amazing event tonight, for the film, for the book, for the opportunity, and for bringing all of these amazing people together. We were up here talking about how really historical this is and um, what a moment. Um, my question is outside of the issue of justice. Um, many of us didn't and will never get any justice, right? However, healing is a part of what stands before all, before all of us. And for, for some people, justice is a part of that healing, but for many of us who will never get it. Um, it with that in mind, what do survivors, what are you finding, particularly those of us who work with survivors, what are survivors needing from us as a community for their healing? I'd like to answer that. Um, continue to do what you do. Surround them with love, no judgment, um, be patient. And because I don't, I mean, this happened to me back in the 90s, and I don't know if I'm quote unquote healed. So I think it's a daily process. And um, some of the things that helped me was um, being at Spelman College for 10 years working in the Women's Research and Resource Center. If it wasn't for Dr. Cole and Beverly Guy Sheftall and all the folks there, I, I don't know if I would still be stuck with some of that old stuff or, or some of the beliefs. So just being on that campus and being uh, around all these successful or uh, black women and seeing the courage and on an academic level, I had to also reach back and think about whose, whose uh, shoulders I was standing on. The, the black women who have been raped and those we will never know, their names. And so that kind of helped me. I mean, I'm, like I said, I'm still processing all of that. But I had to understand that this is not new. I'm not the only black woman who's ever been raped. I'm standing on some, some shoulders of some sisters who have been through that and still here, or, or, or just kept me going. And so they have to, it's a constant work of, of, of just telling yourself that you're worthy. And, and you gotta surround that sister or those sisters with love. Take them somewhere on a retreat. Um, let them express themselves. Uh, and one of the things that it helped, has helped me up until this time too, I started getting among people or connecting with folks that had the same mindset as, as, as myself. And I started getting, I don't necessarily do what Aisha does, which is go away and um, be able to just, you know, get into me for a minute. But I do take those moments on a daily basis or on a weekly basis to love myself. And I had to constantly tell myself that it wasn't my fault. Who cares about, just because a woman has a short skirt, okay. You know, that men need to learn that that doesn't mean that she deserves anything. If anything, be a man and say, sister, you ain't gotta disrespect yourself like that to get noticed by men or society. 
Because you got to understand that sometimes some of those women have gone through things and they're just acting out and they're hurt. So we got to, you know, forgive them and just educate them and let them know that we love them and, and they should love themselves. And, and that's not something that you can just do overnight. It's just constant, constant, constant. So you have to constantly work on yourself and know that you are worthy and that you got a mission here. Once, like I said, I was, I was victimized, but I'm not a victim, I'm a survivor. And so I felt that duty to, when I, after I uh, exposed my story, not only in this um, particular film, I've uh, released my energy by writing an article in the Black Women's um, uh, Newsletter that used to come out of Atlanta, the, and the Black Women's Health Project. And it was amazing that after I wrote that story, how I had all of these women, even on Spelman campus, professors who had never talked about their experience could talk to me about it. And they, they, they thanked me because I, by me speaking out and saying, no, I didn't do anything wrong. You know, it gave them voice. And that made me feel good because some of these sisters had been carrying this weight around for like 20 years. 10 years, 30 years. And so I would say always, if, you're, if you have had that experience at the point when you can, you know, you feel comfortable to heal, talk about it. It's okay. Because that by me telling my story, it helps the other person who's just getting ready to go through this journey. And I'll make myself available. And I will go in front of any crowd or anybody and just, you know, constantly say, you've got to work on yourself. Know you are worthy. And do the work. I don't want to. Can I address a question that came from the back, I guess, um, about what to do and how to help? Um, 1981 was my horrible year. Um, and I was teaching at a predominantly white institution. Um, there was nobody. My family rallied around me. But I swore everybody to silence because I didn't want anybody to know that two black men had broken into our house. And I, I couldn't figure out why these two black men were in my house, okay? Uh, I have a husband, nine-year-old son in the house. They looted, they took everything not pinned down, and they raped me constantly in our home. I couldn't talk about that. I couldn't tell anybody. And so people had to find out from me that something was wrong. When I met Aisha, I was almost, I guess, halfway through, if not finished the book, Surviving the Silence. And that, for me, was the important thing, surviving the silence. I believe silence kills. Yeah. Yeah. And I believe that the stigma and the shame just grows in that silence. And I know it did for me. And I had to get out, and I didn't know how. So any therapist, any person working with rape survivors or people who you think might be rape survivors, um, yes, telling them that they're OK, they're safe to come there, but they have to tell. They have to tell these secrets. In 81, I looked for black women. I mean, I put out flyers for black women. I didn't say it was about rape. I just said I wanted to talk to black women. Nobody answered my call. Nobody. Um, and so then I surreptitiously sent out flyers saying, if you are a black woman and you experienced rape, uh, please call this number. And now when I tell friends about this, they laugh at me. I changed the phone number, the house, everything, so that it would be secretive. And gradually these black women called the number, and we sat and we talked, and that's the book, Surviving the Silence. Because we survived silence before we survived the horrors and the pain of rape. And so please, people who get to talk to these young women, it's, it's not easy to step forward and say, I was raped. Because as black women, we're not supposed to think we can be raped. We've been taught otherwise, at least my generation. Maybe the younger women, it's good if you're 
healthy and know that you can speak about being violated. But as a grown woman married with a son, I was so afraid that my son, our son, would only know these black men who had come into our home and raped. So I just want to say the silence needs to go. And this is part of it. Aisha is part of it. Um, when I met Aisha, we had tuna fish sandwiches and a deli in North Philly. And she said, I want to put on film what you're talking about with these women. And that's where our relationship began. And it's I, just wonderful. I salute you, Aisha, and all the people involved in No. Um, you're amazing. Thank you. I want to lift up the power of the film that we have just seen to educate. And if there was one thing that we could do tonight, Sister Shiro Aisha, it would be to spread that film everywhere. Because it is so easy, even for those of us who think either as survivors or those who love and comfort survivors, even those of us who think we understand this most horrific, barbaric process, we still revert to, it's all about sex. Rape is not about sex. Rape is about violence. And we have to call it for that. And we have to do what this film does that our sister who just spoke lifted up. We have to admit that the violence is committed by black men in our own communities. Yes. And if that does not say we do not understand the systemic stuff that oppresses us, but we gotta educate ourselves about what this is that can so destroy women, men, and children. Hi, my name is Sheila Alexander Reed, and I am Aisha's partner. So she feels the love and the value.
and that she is not, no, there's nothing wrong with her or him, and, um, and to love each other, it's so important, um, and to leave room for people to be vulnerable with you, and that silence, yes it is, silence is violent, and it is horrible, but sometimes you need to be silent so someone can talk, and to listen to them, um, so, that's all I have to say. I think my um, word would be uh, life changing. <laughs> oh, I was just gonna say outrage and anger. Okay, I, I, that that film made me outrage and angry, and 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 made me. I, I show the film. I usually probably know this to my uh, classes every semester, and I want them to be outraged. I mean, really want them to be outraged. And I, <laughs> you know, want, I, I wanted to, to go, to, go in front of Farrakhan's house, <laughs> or whatever it had to be and, and, and to confront him. I mean, that's, that, that's, that's what I wanted. That's how I was feeling sitting there. Outrage and angry. And I don't understand why we as a community are not outraged and angry by what happens to us. I know we were asked for one word, <laughs> but I've got to beg for about five. This film made me feel in the process of being a part of it, and I feel it deeply now in the marrow of my bones. Hear the words, our silence will not save us. One word, that's hard. Um, <laughs> learning experience for me. Yeah, it's not one word here either. Um, it's, it's a deep honor to have worked with my child this year. And I mean, I, I can't really ex express that, but I think you know. Um, but the respect that I have for you by working with you, um, because I've worked on a lot of films, I've worked with a lot of producers and a lot of directors, and and I, I'm not saying this just to be, uh, because you're here and you're here and this is honoring you, but you are the fairest director I've ever worked with, and I mean that. I mean, I mean, in terms of acknowledging and, and, and trying to pay people with their worth and going out of your way to make everybody feel acknowledged and important and heard and seen and, you know, and, you, and, and with integrity because when you say you're going to do something, you do it. And I hate to say that I work with other people of color, women, who don't do that. They say they will and then they don't. Um, and, and you have, you have. So thank you for all these years of, of no. Thank you. Isha. You know, I don't have one word, but I will say that it's been 25 years and I didn't remember that I watched the film until I saw the credits. But um, <laughs> I was there at one time. And, um, you know, I have to really acknowledge that, you know, knowing Aisha and watching her from broken, son is broken, um, with her little baby locks, and she's a little bit, just a tad bit younger than I am, but um, to see her mature through the making of this film and seeing it in its fruition and going through the, the sort of the multiple um, cuts of the film over the years, it's just amazing to, to be here, particularly in this room, and, um, and, and watch it with everybody. And having been in this room for so many other films and so many other um, women who came through this uh, theater at the time, and, and Louis, a lot of our work, most of us on this stage we not, came through Scribe and wouldn't have happened without um, Scribe Video Center and half the women that are on this panel. So, 
Thank you, Lily. Well, like everyone else, it's really hard to keep this to one word. Um, I'll just simply say um, uh, that my work on, on your documentary, on our documentary, on all of our documentary was um, the beginning of forgiveness. Um, it's a work in progress um, in terms of my own journey. But also, I would say it was just a great honor and blessing. Um, when I moved to Philadelphia in 1992, I really didn't know so. I came to work at AFSC, and I each and I worked in the same office. And we became fast, great friends, lifelong friends. And I just love her. You know, she is just a good, pure hearted, very giving, sweet sister. Um, and I've been enormously, enormously blessed to know her and to have the opportunity to work on this great film. So I thank you, my sister. Um, I would say love, love for Aisha, for all that you have uh, brought and also are still bringing to uh, our community, everything that you have done for us. And uh, somewhere, empowerment. Though I'm meant to be the eldest, I have to say that you have brought me a lot, that you have been, even though I didn't say so, you have been a model for me of um, how to be an out in the world and how to denounce and fight against any kind of injustice. Thank you very much. Um, for me, working on No was an absolute blessing. It was just an absolute blessing. Um, elevated. First, it was an honor to have been included, but I also just want to say. You don't know how many women's lives you save by sharing them, giving them permission to say what has happened to them. I know the anti-rape movement pulled me back from the brink of suicide, so that's why I always tell my story, because I never know when another sister needs to be pulled back. So thank you. Aisha gave me sisterhood and other women great that I could talk to. Um, Aisha taught me perseverance, and I'm reminded of that seeing the film tonight and thinking about my own projects that are many years in the making, so thank you. And just being a part of this film is, I mean, this is a movement that made this film, so thank you. I would say challenging uh, 25 years later, the challenges are still there, and I appreciate being able to remember that we have so much more to do, but also very appreciative of what you've given us, Alicia. <laughs> Mentorship, um, I've learned so much from No and from you, Asia, that I, like I was saying earlier, part of the reason I do what I do is because of what I learned from you. Thank you. profoundly therapeutic and healing to participate in the uh, as a rape survivor as well as someone who is conceived from rape that I later found out. And it is so important to break the silence and to and to create spaces where women feel comfortable and heard and seen to be able to share their stories and to hear. I am honored to be a part of No. I am chosen family and I'm so honored. Okay, um, I feel heard, I felt heard. 
Um, I just said I made her put dance in it in the film. I did, and she made me speak when I did it. I feel uh, honored and educated, and I feel like you're giving me guardrails on how to evolve. Um, I have to say um, fortitude and vision. Yeah. So uh, for me, I think the experience was heartrending and heart opening, and that you really challenged me in my work, but it, it was always with love. Impressed and inspired.
hoping to see you tomorrow at Annenberg School for Communication. Thank you.